Welcome everybody back to uh, Crew Justice, empowered by Witness Innocent, hosted by yours truly, Herman Lindsay. I'm Florida's 23rd death row exoneree, and our show is about educating people about things that's going on around the death penalty. We also have uh, a special guest today who was also uh, like two cells away from me on death row. Uh, we call him Shorty, but his name is Clementez, and I'll let him introduce himself to you all. Uh, but most important thing I want to say is that as you were uh, doing this show, uh, watching this show, doing this show, I ask that you do please share our show on uh, your page. And the reason I ask, it's very important to me that you share this is because our purpose is to educate people. What you don't know is that someone that views this uh, video may be a potential juror. And we all know in society, a lot of people don't like being on the jury or things like that. And we want them to understand how important it is to understand what beyond a reasonable doubt means. What, uh, that the state don't always get it right. And, and we don't want to see anyone uh, finding someone guilty and then later finding out they're innocent. So if they if view this uh, video, they may just see when they do pick, be picked for a jury that, you know, they need to pay attention to the evidence and question. Uh, but right now I'm going to allow uh, Clementes to introduce himself. Clementes? Hey, good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, my name is Clemente Aguirre. I'm number uh, 28 on the reef from Death Row in the state of Florida. Um, now I think it's 31 of us. Uh, big community, a lot of mistakes. And like Herman was saying, you know, we were just trying to open your eyes and think for yourself and research and read. Um, because 31 exonerations from that row is, uh, is too many. We lead the nation on exonerations and how many times they got it wrong. And uh, like Herman was saying, it's very important that you can share this. Uh, you should do it just for uh, education purpose, you know. Yeah, so I'm here in Tampa, my brother. How you been? I bet all right. As I was saying before, as you see, he's 28 and I'm 23. And that means it's uh, what, three in between, four in between has actually been exonerated, which is self-analyzable, run right. And I forgot the other one name, the Bulls or something like that. Uh, and uh, this is continuing to happen, which is kind of like a good thing. You know, a lot of people say that Florida leads the nation in death row exonerated. But um, we also got to lead. We, we also say we have to say that we're leading the nation of bringing innocent people off for death rows too. Uh, so, so we got to look at it. But Mentes, you was placed on death row and your case can be read on the uh, internet anytime somebody wish to uh, uh, re read it. I, I was wondering, what was the contributing factors that you think that caused your wrongful conviction? Well, um, you know, like many, like many Latino people from Central and South America, I came here looking for the American dream. I came illegally. I was running for gun violence and looking for a better life. And I ended up living in a trailer park. You know, it took me three months and 16 days to make it to this country. And, uh, you know, I was working in a restaurant, uh, washing dishes, prepping food, and, and I used to hang out with my neighbors who don't speak Spanish, and at the time, I didn't speak English. And one day, it was the point that I need to find a place to live because the wife of my roommate was coming with his son, and, you know, I, I need to move. So I did. I went and looked for a place, and it was my day off, and we got a couple of drinks, and those times I used to use drugs and all of that. And, you know, I had like a night vendor of uh, alcohol, you know, enjoying my day off. I used to work a lot. <clears throat> so I, I went to the house and, and I found them there. And because my illegal immigration status, uh, I was so fearful that they're gonna deport me. So what I did was I, I run home, but my, if you call it a mistake, I was trying to help, I was trying 
to see if they were alive. So I got into crime, in, the, in the crime scene and I didn't call the police. So they used all of this against me. Uh, they were accusing me of rape. They were accusing me of, of stealing from them. When they realized nothing was missing, they stick with the rape thing. And I say, I, I didn't rape nobody, I didn't kill nobody, and I offered my DNA in the moment in time, which it was this, uh, I don't know, like eight, nine years later. Uh, so it, it takes a long, long time. It's, it's, it's like the usual, not the usual thing, Herman, you know, when you are minority, uh, a color person, don't have family or don't have funds to have a good attorney to represent you or to believe in you or investigate. Um, people just go with what the state say or what the police say or what the investigators say. Mm -hmm. And that was a common that was a common thing between all of us that are in, in, in their role or have been exonerated from there. And the one they are still there, they claim their innocence. Uh, <laughs> which I believe as many of them in there still. Uh, you know, it's the same old thing, man, when you are a minority and, and don't have the funds to provide uh, for your own defense. So when you uh, got, uh, when, you, when, when you found out that, oh, uh, let me go back to this question because this is a question that a lot of people um a lot of people actually uh ask is how how did you make it through when you you're wrongfully convicted for something and placed on the maximum uh penalty it is and you're facing death uh what did you do to cope with that what well, i mean how did that 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 feeling being being wrong for convicted and looking to die for something you you didn't do was was did you have any hope? The majority of the time, it hope is what keep you alive. Uh, you know, you always uh, we always pray. We always trying to to keep it calm and focus on things of how can we get out of there? How can we prove our innocence? Because at the end of the day, you know they're trying to kill us all, right? So at the beginning, it was very, very difficult. At the beginning, it was, it, you know, this, Herman, you know, this, this, this thing, for people to understand this, we might look normal outside, but we're forever going to be scarred, forever, for what happened to our center. Because we know all of us one day will die, uh, but it's gonna be God's decision. But, but to have somebody, a man or woman, um, decide when you die is, is, is very difficult that people own your life like that. I pray a lot. At the beginning, I used to cry. I cry, I cry, and, 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 and I have said this many times before, I, I had like an epiphany like three months later. It's like, it was that voice in my head to say, "Are you gonna, are you gonna fight, or are you gonna let them kill you?" And I, and I, and I was asking, "How, how can I fight? I don't, I don't speak the language. I don't read the language. How can I do it?" And I learned to read it, and it took me a few years, but I learned it. And and eventually, I wrote many letters. And thank God, somebody uh, step up. The what innocent project step up, and and they they test for the evidence and and. We find out the truth. There, uh, well, they find out. I knew the truth, but they find out the truth because at the end of the time, at the end of the day, they just have my word for it. So when the evidence came and they see it, it's not my DNA in there, and it's somebody else's there, and they will find confessions. That was, uh, I feel more hopeful than anything. Even though take more years of denial, trials, and, and whatnot, and hard fight. When you was exonerated, you know, one of the biggest challenges we have here in Florida is that uh, they're placing people on death row wrongfully and then find out they're uh, placed the wrong person on death row. And they are actually not uh, giving us any conversations 
uh, for uh, no programs to help us on the feet. They basically just put us out there and say, hey, we're something, hey, you, that, I, my bad, and just throw us out there um, to fight. And one of the biggest problems is when they, even when they do that, we have that murder case on our background, which uh, one time you go get a job or you try to find um, a, a resident or something like that, you know, it, it, anything that use a criminal background, that murder shows up. And whether you're guilty or not, it, 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 it plays a part of the decision of a company that's using it. Um, and we've been fighting the conversation bill for a, a long time. Long but time. It's, it's, it just don't want to get it right. Every year they come and they pass an amendment on it, but it, it still don't pass the amendment to, to getting to the point where, like, for instance, to qualify for it, at first, if you had a prior conviction, you you can uh, get it. So we end up getting that out of the out of the Florida bill, uh, the clean hands out of the compensation bill. But we still stuck with the part where we actually have to go back to court and get a certification saying we are of our actual innocent to to do it. And it's like the Florida Supreme Court decision is not proof of actual innocence. It's not proof that they, they convicted the wrong person. But the conversation bill actually speaks that um, if you was wrongly convicted, it don't say if you was actually innocent. It say if you were wrongly convicted that you uh, shall receive compensation and they still refuse to correct the language in that part. So with that being said, it's, uh, you know, thank God for witness innocent and a couple of the organizations that's out there that's been helping me educate myself and promoting me to speak and stuff like that you know, uh, helping with the emergency funds and stuff, you know, that I've been able to survive right now. I'm surviving at the bare minimum, especially when COVID came. Oh, man, when COVID came, everything shut down. It's very rarely that we could go and do uh, speaking events and things like that. Uh, things got much more difficult, and I thank God that with the sense that was in my corner. But for you, how was this not only the pandemic, but actually being out uh, of, of, uh, of a death row and this statue that you should receive compensation under, you didn't receive. So that means you're out there fighting by yourself. So how is how is how are you dealing with the trauma of that? The 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 I mean is is very it has to be very frustrating. I mean, I know, but I was trying to get you to tell me, to tell the people uh, um, from your point of view. Uh, I, soon I get out for me was very, very challenging and frustrating because the start to say, you got 90 days from the day they reversed your trial and convictions to ask for a new trial, not only for ask for compensation. But also say, if they are trying you again for that crime, or you are suspect of that crime, you cannot seek compensation. So how can I ask for compensation when they were taking me to trial, right? And my 90 days run out. So that's the excuse they're using against me for not to compensate me. And as uh, we witness the innocent and um, FADP and, and innocent project, we, we have been trying to change that. And you and I have been going over there to talk to these senators and you know, they, when they become about money, they are very uptight. Um, because my legal immigration status, I am not allowed to work. I, I, my court day is November 9, 2024, my first appearance in immigration. So until then, I can no ask uh, permission to work. So I am not allowed to work. And, you know, I was doing these things, uh, uh, speaking engagements, uh, where I would go with some of the Exxonerys fellows and brothers uh, to places to talk. Or, and we used to travel a lot, right? And with me as a boss, because I, I am not allowed to have a driver's license either, or a Florida ID, for that matter. So I, I took my passport. At the beginning, I was with a newspaper with my photo. 
is what I was as I was taking as an ID. Um, but fortunately, I was able to um, have my country to provide me with a passport. So now I use that as a, as an ID. But when COVID when COVID came, it's like I was in prison again, man. Because everything was shut down, everything was closed. I was supposed to be home because I don't have no health insurance. I don't want to get sick. The bill is going to be too high for me to pay it later. So, you know, I was like in my zone. I just get up for the necessary, like go buy food or whatever, you know, the people will provide me with gift cards or whatever to go and buy uh, some groceries and whatnot. I've been fortunately that I have a lot of people who, and organizations who have helped me uh, through my, with my rent, with my closing, um, with my bills. But eventually, you know, it's, it's a point that you want to be, you want to be your own man, right? And as long as I live, as what I say, as long as I live, I'm going to keep on talking. They make, uh, by mistake, uh, this guy who is so against the death penalty and so biased against the death penalty because I know what I do to people. And I'm telling you, uh, we should need to get rid of that. Would you would you consider? Uh, I know. Let me ask this: Before you was even convicted, did you did you know anything about the death penalty here in the United States? I knew it was in Texas. I didn't know it was in almost every state. <laughs> you know, I and and I didn't understand nothing about no uh, federal. Uh, the death penalty in the federal way or the state. I didn't know the difference. To me, it was the same. Uh, but no, really, I was one of those persons, Herman. I, I never had no problem with police. I never was arrested. I never was nothing, right? And to me, I used to think back then of whoever was there is because they did something. And, and you know, maybe God, but God worked in different ways or very strange ways because after what happened to me and after I have seen what happened to all of us and the people that we know in there and the people that we will live in and, and around the states, um, there's I think 172 dead royals on the recent United States so far. And if you have that many mistakes, um, I can only imagine you have executed one uh, one innocent person and one is one too many. So no, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I really didn't, didn't have any idea at all. It's, it's amazing because I, I didn't know either. You know, like you say, I, I knew they executed somebody, but I didn't know. And that's the thing about it. Uh, um, more people are now being educated about the death penalty and how it's way more costly. And there's no way that they can say the death penalty is actually um, a means of justice in any kind of um, fashion or form, you know, actually being there. Um, I've met a lot of people such as yourself, you know, and it's like, it's like you know, the, the, some of the people we uh, met while we was on death row, we actually had a good time on death row. You know, we actually had a good time. It was like a family, you know, it's like a family. So it is it, most people, if they could actually see how um, those guys on death row, they would believe, they wouldn't happily believe some of the things that it was accused of. Now, some may be guilty, you know, as right. a lot of them that's guilty, except their faith. You know, and they pre prefer to be in uh, life in prison instead of um, being executed. But, you know, and, and surely you can relate to this. Those days that they actually doing the execution, they come out and bring somebody out to cell and take them on death watch. It, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing. And the, the way they deal with it, and then we all quiet that night at six o'clock, you know, waiting until the officer come and tell us we have lost one, you know, and it's it's a it's a uh, it's like uh, you waiting in the waiting room at the hospital, and they tell find out one of your family or friends or uh, family members or friends, uh, the doctors come out and tell you, okay, he didn't make it, he passed away, you know, it's it's a terrible thing. 
And it's a lot of them that's out there that I wish that we they wouldn't be on death row. You know, we had a lot of good basketball games together. Yes. <laughs> had I, a lot of good. I, I, you know, Herman, I want to tell you something. You know, I, I, I live 33 executions. I usually was one of those people who count every single one, every single man that they, that they execute while I was in that room. I went through 33 and three suicides. And, you know, that's why when I find out about, you know, you know, when people asking for the evidence to be tested, so to me, it's, it's I, I believe you. I don't know, it's, it's, it, it comes so truthful because you are already there. So the only reason you are asking this is because you're really innocent and you want to be uh, proven innocent and show the evidence or whatever. And that's why the, it took my attention this case in, in Tennessee and, and Kurt and I, or witness the innocent who was the first person with DNA uh, here in Florida, uh, ex-honorary, um, we were talking about it and we make a lot of noise because they didn't want to test the DNA of the, in this main case. And uh, we sent letters to uh, Governor Lee and, and asked him. And that's in the Rodney Reed case? No, what this is uh, Purvis, Purvis Payne. Payne. Yeah. Okay. And the man been begging for 30, 31, 32 years. And he been in their role for that long. And, you know, his sister speak and, and she say he is not all up there anymore because, you know, it's what, it's what the thing will do to you that night by 12 is. But um, I'm glad to tell you that um, it was, it was test the DNA. Finally, they allow it and it come back negative. It's not his DNA nowhere. So, you know, I encourage you all people to write Governor Lee and ask him to do the right thing and let this man go free, man, because. He, he said it, I am innocent, I didn't do this. I just found him dead in his case, it's just like mine. But it happened 30 something years ago. So, you know, it's always the same thing. And, and you know some, you know, if, if, if you was the, if someone wanted to really know how dangerous the death penalty is, talking about the cases out of Texas is, should, should change a person's mind because, it, Texas mishandled the death penalty a whole lot. For instance, I'm gonna go back to the uh, Cameron Todd Willingham case uh, where he was accused of setting a fire and killing his um, kids. And I think his wife was in it, I'm not sure. But before his execution, it was some expert witnesses came to bat and said that he did not start that fire. That fire was caused by faulty electric. And <clears throat> even some of the uh, uh, experts in his, uh, that testified in his case, rec recanted their story and said, well, we can see that. And they asked the governor to stop the execution and the governor paid no attention to it. You know, we even got a case out there now where they just executed a person. And here it is, they finding out the DNA wasn't his. So this is a, when they ask, have you ever, uh, do you know of any person that was innocent that actually got executed? Well, Texas just marked the first one that we can say definitely for sure that was innocent and they executed it. And they can't bring him back. They can't make it up to his family. They can't do anything. And people was telling the governor in that case, to halt the state, do the the the, the do the the uh, DNA testing, and they failed to do so, and that brings me around to, I'm I'm hoping that Biden, and I I, I act if anybody from Biden administration um, watching this video, I ask that Biden uh, consider uh, stopping federal execution because. Yeah. One of the things about it is that if he, the president, stopped executions in the federal level, then governors in the state will follow behind him. I would believe so. They will. They, they because one, they'll want to be on his good side, 
and they feel like, okay, if the president stopped it, we should stop it too. And, you know, that's why I don't know if Biden understand the most how, how important it is for him to stand up to what he was saying to uh, actually um, do something about stopping the federal execution. But I hope he do something and do something soon before we lose another one. Yes. I, it, it shouldn't be, I, you know, you, you and I have been talking to these uh, senators here and whatnot, and we always tell them, and you know this, it, it shouldn't be that hard to do right. It shouldn't be that hard to do right. You, you got there to that position, saying I take to attorneys, you want to be an attorney because you want to change something. You want to, you know, it, it shouldn't be that difficult to follow the law. It shouldn't be that difficult to do right. And, and, and apparently people pay a lot of politics and, and what is the best for the party they, they represent and whatnot. And it shouldn't be like that. And you, you should, people put you there because they believe something you say to them. So you should fight for the people, you know? And the best thing to do is, to me, is completely, completely take off the death penalty because it's too many times that we got it wrong. And you can know, assure people the next time you always gonna have it right. I, I honestly wish that, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it, people don't understand how painful it is when um, your exonery or anybody in, you know, one of the hardest things about being in that capital is when you go in their office, they talk good, they know what is right, they give you some points to even go on to help you down the line to fight. Uh, but when it comes to the voting in the committee, they change it because of what the speaker may think, you know, the speaker control what bills go on to what committee. And if he don't want to entertain it, it's not going to become a bill, you right. know? And so if they feel like if they uh, push, push towards a bill, want to push a bill through, but the speaker is denied and they try to challenge it to push it through, then all the other bills that they have, the speaker gonna deny too. And it shouldn't be that way. You know, it shouldn't be that way. That's just something that needs to change in our house and our Senate, you know, to see who, uh, what bill be dictated and which bill not. You know, it should be a committee that actually say what bills can be heard and what not, not just one person that would say bat it down and it, it'd be batted down. And it was, it's so painful when, when I spoke in the uh, committee and then I had a senator back me up, Senator Brandon back me up and say, you know, Mr. Lindsay is right. We, uh, we as Florida don't have a clean hand. So why should we have a clean hand act in the bill? You know, and they fought to take it out right then, you know, and they moved uh, to take it out, but then, the Sprouse say, no, you got to have certain crimes. So the bill ended up with certain crimes involved. Uh, and then we turned around and following year, we end up getting it completely out. But the thing of it is, is that it should have been taken out from the beginning. Right. So now the people of, of, of the state of Florida who do, do, do the voting, they need to... Uh, start holding their, uh, letting their um, senator and representative in their area know how they feel. But that brings to mind, you, and, and this is something, uh, you was disqualified from the compensation bill. And uh, senator, was a senator or representative uh, in the Ducho bill? Uh. Torres? Torres, yes. Okay. So Torres introduced your, your bill and your bill went nowhere. When here it is, he does not qualify for the conversation bill, but 
y'all uh, the confiscation statute. But y'all do have the authority to give him some compensation for what happened to him for being wrongfully convicted. And we couldn't get enough to get on the bandwagon to do what was right. And you know it's right. You yeah. know you shouldn't. This man has spent all these years <laughs> in prison on death row, um, a, a, a traumatizing. And they always say, I, I can't be, I, I, I can't even begin to understand how you feel. You know, it's so bad. You, they can't understand. So if you know it's so bad that you can't really understand how it feels, you know it's a terrible thing. Why not do the right thing and grant his bill? But sometimes it's too hard. This is this, this is the reason I love I love I I think things are gonna change right now. That things are getting better with COVID and whatnot. But I love to go to college, and more than anything, because these representatives or senators love to come to college to speak, and I love to go there because I tell them what well, he's telling you. Don't hold on him to it because he, his party don't want it. It won't go nowhere. If they don't agree with it, it don't go nowhere. Because it's what the best for the party, not what, what the best for the people. So I love to tell them, you, you, you can change this. And the way you can change this is voting. Because a lot of people don't like to vote. And I like, I, hey, come on, go vote, go vote. I wish I could vote. I know it's only one vote, but still, you know. I tell them, man, you know, voting, changing people, changing justice, changing status, changing. People will do it if you demand that from them. I, I, th this, this, I mean, the way things are um, here in Florida is, is, is extremely crazy. And, you know, I think, I think without, I think with things opening up, we may be able to get that um, accomplished a little bit better. Uh, this year, but um, I want to go back to why is the reason that you cannot go to school? Because don't have ID, don't have uh, American ID, number one, and number two, I don't have a social security. Huh. Because, uh, you know, I want to say thanks to FIU. You know, FIU is uh, really behind me. They're, uh, they're training me to uh, they're training me for mitigation, litigation work. You know, um, they, Hannah Gorman inspired me to go get my uh, private investigator. And right now, you know, uh, the public defender's office are calling me um, to work uh, to work with them on consulting uh, with uh, death penalty uh, people that's facing the death penalty and have possible plea. You know, um, a lot of people don't understand that it, it, it's more than one way to fight uh, yeah. to help. Uh, and I try to, if I see someone that's potentially going to end up on death row um, and the evidence is there and their state is given a plea, I encourage them to take that plea because, you know, it, we, it, it, getting on death row is something that you don't want. I mean, it, to some people, it's laid back, it's good, but actually, at the end of the day, only one thing happens. They take your life. Yeah, you don't leave that. You take all those years in solitary confinement, and it's a tiresome, and, and it's, it's, it's a mental battle. So, you know, the only thing I can say is, you know, I, if you ever get to the point where you can get to education, get education, I know FIU is a school that is promoting, um, trying to get a uh, program started uh, to help Death Row exonerees coming out and using their uh, experience to um, help in the justice system and uh, their views and things. And, and that's the thing, you know, a lot of times they say they didn't want criminals to be in the office or they didn't want criminals to be attorneys and stuff. And the reason they did that is, well, let me not say criminals, but people convicted of a felony and they've been to prison because what people don't know, prison is a 
uh, extremely uh, uh, high uh, college. You learn a lot in behind those walls. Believe yeah. me, you learn a lot. You deal with so many different personalities. That's psychological. That's psychologists. You you learn game. That's psychologists. You learn. You talk to people about the, uh, trying to do right. That's psychiatrists. You know. You learn a lot of things behind the walls to help uh, uh, build society into something strong. They feel like. Most people convicted of felon, if they get any kind of control or power like that, they're actually going to try to take over and make things like they can control. But in reality, it's just like me. My goal is to assist those public defenders and those attorneys and the defendant into doing something that's right, that one, save a lot of taxpayers' money. It yeah. saves a lot of taxpayer money. A trial for a murder case million dollars or so you know yeah. save taxpayers money and not only that it also saves a life that's true it also saves a life it's so you know, like the people, you know the people got support out there when they get out of get out of prison you know like that's why i commend uh witness the innocent i why you know i'm so proud of uh, fadp uh the sunny center the one who helped me it's an, it's an extraordinary woman who was there for 20 years and that road too. Um, and finally, they found out she didn't do it. Uh, Innocent Project, Latino Justice USA, you know, all these organizations that you can you can reach out and help and inform yourself of the work they do. Um, it helps people like us not come back to prison because now we're part of the system. And what people expect from us, officers, police, judges, and attorneys, is that we come back to prison, that we're going to make a mistake and we're going to come back to prison because we damage. Um, but, you know, when, all, when you get involved in organizations like this and you fight for what is right and for the life, um, to abolish something that we see that is wrong always and forever has been, um, I think it helps us to stay afloat, you know, and have a purpose to live one more day to go and help. So I appreciate, I appreciate that, I, I, I will look into it. And, and you know, the thing about it with Witness the Innocent, uh, through Witness the Innocence, we come contact and assist in so many different ways. I mean, we have ANJ that assists uh, state attorneys, uh, private investigators, uh, uh, lab uh, lab technicians, and all of that uh, on the prosecuting side. Then on, we also uh, have the ANJ that's going talking to public defenders and police officers and all everybody on the defense side. So we're we're in the middle of of this this uh, criminal justice reform, and we're not biased. I mean, we're not we're not prejudiced in any way. We're working on both sides of the law, you know, educating all for one purpose to seek justice and justice only. How to make it better, you know? And um, I'm proud to be a part of that. You know, we even deal with legislators, you know, uh, governors and, and other uh, individuals that's higher as making the laws and stuff. And we are a prime icon to say that the members of Witness Innocent, who has been exonerated from death row, is using their talent from a, what have been and how they have been impacted in a, a negative way, in a positive way, uh, when that I mean that shows that a person can come out and be a part of society and it, you know and have no problem. So it takes time and effort, though. But, you know, huh? it takes a lot of time and effort, but you know, eventually, you little by little go go getting involved in society again. You know, little by little. It takes. But but you know something, I from two thousand nine when I first joined the Innocent FADP. Right, from that time, it's it, it was a time, uh, uh, Shorty, that we went restlessly. I'm um, traveling up and down, back and forth, uh, uh, the state of Florida, um, educating and speaking and thing. But it, it it pays off, you know. Here now, back then, majority uh, agreed in the death penalty. Now, majority agree not in the death penalty. Yes. 
you know, so it pays off in the long run. And being a part of that movement, you know, it, you know, we might not see the complete change in this lifetime, you know, but the part of it is, is that we paved the way for the ones to come behind us to go ahead and knock it down and actually seal the, the abolishment of death penalty. Yeah, I mean, it made me feel so good. It made me feel so good. I see so many efforts, so many no's. Like when you go to court for a new trial, no, no, deny, deny. You know, a lot of people wasn't perceptive, but I see it through the past two years that I've been, you know, involved in this. It's been like a change of mind of people. More than anybody, young people. Um, they have, uh, there's millennials that they call it. So it's, it's been a, it's been a success so far. I think we can do better, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's been it's been hard. It's been hard work, and I cannot imagine when y'all started doing this uh, uh, how many years ago. But it's been it's been little by little. It's getting better, and I think it's gonna be better. And, and I agree completely with you. Maybe we don't see it in our lifetime, but you know, pay the way. Well, I didn't use the over our time and our lovely staff is patient but needs some time. <clears throat> but I want to I want to thank my, no shorty, you gotta understand. I love my staff. They're, they're the best in the world. I wouldn't want to work with anyone else really. Um I'm so comfortable with them. Um and they make things happen for me in so many different ways. Um they they they're a big part of who I am now in the things I'm involved in. Uh, so I do thank um, my staff at Witness the Innocent and my uh, executive uh, director, Kurt Bloodworth, and our chairman of the board, Wemmy. Um, uh, it, it's just an amazing thing being part of Witness the Innocent. Um, but for right now, um, I'm going to bring this show to an end. And I want everyone to know, if you want to reach out, you know, go to witnessinnocent.org. You can look at all the exonerees, their bios. If you need um, one to host a, a speaking event, fundraiser, or whatever you need one to come tell a story for, um, we're here. And we'll be proud to get on a plane, bus, or whatever, uh, uh, virtual. We have the capability of doing it virtually. Um, we're here. So um, with that said, I want to uh, bring this show to an end and thank, thank, you. You. thank you everyone for joining another episode of Crew Justice and I hope you attend some more.